Well, hello, Nick. How are you doing? Record, my brother. Good. That's it. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Your well, boss just got you a couple of days ago. What do you want me to say? You did and we did our bench press together, and we did pull ups. And you did a one armed pull up, sort of like you you had your one arm and the on the other arm. It was very impressive. Yeah, well, your bench pressing was a bit more impressive than my bench pressing. It's it's fair to say, but you know, we're not here to talk about a bench pressing. We actually met because we were at an um, an AIS event, a digital innovation event, and I want to talk about this a little bit because um, I made the observation at the event that well, we're getting into a stale territory. I didn't quite put it like this, but this is how I think about it. I was, I was saying we, we're getting into a little bit of a stale territory ever since Ola and Yangjin and, 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 and Kala wrote their piece on digital innovation and this idea of recombination and layering and modularity. And I was saying like, well, I am missing an alternative theory, a competing theory, a rival theory, something that spurs competition on this conceptual level that could allow us to move forward. We're just too happy with the theory. I didn't quite put it right. like this at the event, but um, and then someone pointed out to me that there are, of course, competing theories, competing, competing views of what matters. And one of them is Yanis Kalinikos' idea about digital innovation is all about data. And it's data that transforms organizing and changes strategy and so forth. And long story short, we have Yanis here with us today. Yanis, how are you? I'm all right, Jan. Thank you very much for inviting me into this very interesting podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Giannis. All right. Record, yeah. here's one of the things. Of all the people in our field who, you know, if I would say that I admire someone's intellect uh, right. above and beyond the peers, like significantly, it's Giannis, right? This, he has read everything. He understands things deeply. He's a very impressive person. And Absolutely. here he is. Coming on our shitty little podcast <laughs> to, with a couple of idiots. Uh, so it's kind of funny. <laughs> well, yeah, this, Nick is absolutely correct, right? So uh, we hadn't met before, you and I, um, but I was so nervous today. I read, <laughs> I spent so much time rereading your papers and uh, and I still feel underprepared. And usually I don't care. Usually I just go in and wing it. But today I want to look good because you're here and, and you know, <laughs> your, your mind is so sharp. We're really happy. Uh, to you, have you. you guys, you are very complimentary to me. Uh, yeah. Well, Wrecker loves your digital objects paper. So, oh, so maybe we Absolutely. should start with that. Is this a competing, like, so it's an ontology. So ontologies are just that. They're like, it's a way of looking at the world. It's a set of words and it's fine, right? We we have these ontologies. We have these ways, just like Young Jin and, and Ola and, and Kale, there's a way of looking at the world and it's fine. And it gives you purchase on the phenomenon. Uh, that uh, of interest, right? Uh, there should be multiple of these, right? Uh, kind of perspectives on this world, and and aren't there? Are we really? Is this a competing one? Do we think? And what we're talking about is Giannis. Uh, you have a couple of different uh, uh, papers uh, yeah. that we're talking about here. I think Nick, the if you refer to the idea of uh, digital objects, we first put forward in MISQ article, which is now called the ambivalent ontology of digital artifact. This is quite aligned, I would say, with the theories of Kale and Yongjin. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. It's uh, in the same spirit. It just tells the story in a slightly different way because whenever you speak about objects, you draw attention more to the interaction between the object and the subject. And you hit two birds, I think, with one stone. In all my life, I thought that objects are very important and that IS and many other um, fields uh, are too biased towards what they call agency and subject. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of the things we do in our life and many of the things that have duration and stability, which are also important attributes, it's not only change that is important, also stability is important. Many of these stable and enduring things that we rely upon to carry on our lives, they have the character of an object. And I think we haven't enough theorized this. And these ideas are not simply mine, they goes back the two important sources of inspiration for me. One is the Russian psychologist Vygotsky, and the other is Adorno, the mm -hmm. 
Frankfurt theory and all his meditation on how the objects and materials shape what people can do in their agency. So this paper, the ambivalent ontology of digital artifacts continues this tradition, wants to attribute more space and more reflection to what stands opposite us, human beings, and what makes us also what we are, and continues in the tradition and think of Simon and also of Yongjin, you and Kali Littinen and Hanfried, some particular so, reaction. So yeah. before we go to your, so Jan loves your your data objects paper and org size, yeah. so I'm sure he's going to want to talk about that. But this, let's go back Nick, to this. Yeah, this so, is really another theory. Exactly. I would say so too. It's a different yeah. thing, but let's yeah. stick with this one for a second. Let's yeah. stick with this one because I actually do see it as an alternative. And maybe this is my uh, reading of, you know, so you're ambivalent. And I always uh, cite that one because I like it. And I think, at least in my reading, when I read, uh, you know, Young Jin at All's paper, it's uh, it's about it's essentially about an architecture. It's a way. It's a layered modular architecture, which is a way of viewing uh, digital objects, if you will. And there's this open-ended character to them, but yet the ontology is fixed, right? It's open-ended through APIs. When I read your paper, the then this is, I think it's 2014. I have 2013. Uh, it's ambivalent, right? It's uh, to me, it's equivalent. I, I love the the uh, strategic the term strategic ambiguity, right? Which is you put something out there, a lot of language, a lot of uh, uh, symbols uh, that in the world, and in by by virtue of their non definition, people can read and use them, and they become very. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, useful in a variety of contexts and different, you know, literatures view this, this idea in different ways. And when I read your paper, that's what I took away from it. It's like, here, these things are reprogrammable. They're kind of malleable. They're kind of, move. there is no fixed ontology. I thought yeah. the way I read your paper as an American yeah. pragmatist is kind of a pragmatic response yeah. to yeah. Yeah. Uh, Young Jin and Kali. And because right, Young Jin totally. likes to, yeah. likes yeah. ontologies. He likes to say what is. Yeah. And yeah. the way I read your paper is the thing that is, is yeah. vague. <laughs> yeah. There is a lot of stuff that is different. There's no doubt about it. And some of the things you say are uh, among those differences. Certainly, there's another style of writing. There's another sensibility to uh, certain types of things. And there's slightly different, uh, uh, I think, purpose uh, with the two papers. You will compare the theory of digital innovation in the ISR, the two, 210 in ISR and this paper. But there is also some important similarities that are built around because these attributes, for instance, uh, Nick, that you mentioned, we trace back then to modularity and granularity. Mm -hmm. So to me, sorry, go on. Yeah, but go on, Jan. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I wanted to also do to jump in and say, like, look, to me, these are not the the theories that are competing. So in a way, you 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 work on digital objects. As to me, it's it's a precursor. To yeah. the to the work on digital innovation and some of the the other consequences because the it sort of it answers the question like some other papers as well what is what is so different about anything digital yeah about that that qualifier in a way um, and 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 I agree with Nick on the interesting bit about this and the the thing that really I guess grabbed the attention of people is this idea of well it's ambivalent that's what what's different here yeah. it could be many things it can change it can evolve you know uh, yeah. it could be ambiguous even. Um, and, and that it makes this object so interesting and that makes digital optics so interesting. And that to me always said like, well, that's why sometimes we have to think about what is different than in digital innovation or in digital transformation or in other types of digitally induced mm -hmm. phenomena, because if and when, you know, this ambivalence comes to the forefront. Now it doesn't have to, right? Some things remain stable or they may be unaffected by this ambivalence, Um but some things are, and you know, and I think yeah, the, some of the work by Yangjin is is about well, innovation is different in parts because because of this ambivalence. Yeah, yeah, I agree, guys. I have no uh, objection to 
to say different things. I agree with you, and you remind me as an author that I don't control all the surpluses of meaning that exist in my work. <laughs> you remind <laughs> me of this. Yeah. And there may be things that... But certainly, uh, uh, but if I make a comparison, this is what I have in mind probably with later, with the article on organization science, yeah. on data objects rather yeah. than digital objects, and the introduction of data as a fundamental construct of inquiry, then something quite different emerges. Because uh, as we have written, not only me, also Christina, and in part also with other colleagues of mine, the idea of data combats or is not good, is not fairly compatible with the idea of architecture. Yes. Because data really are fundaments of meaning first and innovation secondly because you read in them different kinds of situations that this data are meant to describe and this reading is not well captured in my the metaphor of architecture which is really built based on building architecture is a metaphor that comes from building mm. yeah is about components linked to one another. It's an entity. So architecture, just like organizations, are an entity in a sense, yeah. and they're a structured yeah. entity. So when we think of architecture, we think of, whereas data that can different. be structured perhaps, but it's it's not, right? And and it decenters, as you say. The, the data may be structured, uh, Nick, in the sense of being standardized and easily aggregable and computable but mm -hmm. aggregation and computing are not acts of architecture they are mm -hmm. acts of meaning yeah it's how you distill something of this data by piling them up into something bigger and then trying to read in this something bigger computing analytics what they possibly say and what they possibly hide. This yeah. Yeah. is to me an alternative to the theory of architecture and innovation put forward by Kale and Youngjin. And I said to them also, uh, uh, we, we were uh, in the summer together in a conference, I have, re I have read, I have learned enormously by this article, but I want to challenge you guys. You've been my teachers, but I want to tell to challenge you now and, and put forward a theory that is not based on architecture, but on something which I cannot exactly put my finger. But in what I was saying, I understand as meaning extraction, uh, uh, reading analytics in a much broader sense than just uh, you know statistical inference. I like this so much. Um, to me, I think one of the the highlights of this this paper is that, of course, it has a lot of new ideas. We can talk about some of them there, the way that you write about data objects, you and Christina, of course. Um, <clears throat> but also, it's a fundamentally classic IS article. I mean, if we go back in history, we've we've been enamored with this idea of an information or you know data processing and and what is data, what is information, and so forth. These debates they go back for almost half a century. But they've always been on the niche, haven't they? I mean, we've we've had semiotics, we have information processing, we Absolutely. had um, yeah, yeah. information system as symbolic representation systems, and all of these are connected to this essential question: what actually is data? Um, and, you know, but most of the time, we don't care, um, yeah. and if we do care, we 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 look at data as simply representations, right? We take them as zeros and ones that represent some property of an object in the real world and we leave it at that for because you know I don't I don't want to criticize that necessarily I just want to say for the most purposes that view is completely sufficient uh, but Absolutely. in a way you talk to a very core fundamental object of of interest in our field uh, the information slash data bit in an information system Absolutely yeah thank you so much yeah but the idea of data, as you say, is an old idea. It goes back to semiotics, to systems of notation and writing, how we created records, how we recorded 
our transactions and how we remember the past. The roots of data are in the pre-digital age. Of course, the digitization has brought enormous changes, which we would like to discuss perhaps today. But it's also important to link data to their history. Uh, and uh, data as records immediately tell, tell us that they are ways for us people, for us communities to spot things happening out there, register them, and possibly then work with what we have registered and recorded to guide us in the future or understand what has happened better. So accounting records, for instance, in organizations, and in particular, uh, the modern double uh, bookkeeping has been fundamental for creating the institutions we call corporations. Yeah. If you don't have data to compare across products, across sites, and across time periods, you can't have these big entities we call corporations. And well, I isn't that the key? Like when I look at your paper, yeah. uh, it's that temporal aspect of data, right? Architectures are cross-sectional. Uh, organizations, in a sense, are cross-sectional without their histories. The beauty of data is it's what connects the past and present. And now... With AI, right? Uh, all AI is trained on data. It's the future in the sense that it's making predictions, right? So, so it's this temporal thread uh, that that this, constitutes this, culture, right? The, absolutely. Uh, this yeah. this uh, broader perspective then on things and on organization, and that, that links presumably to the previous discussion of ours uh, concerning journal articles. That was not recorded, but I can still refer to it. To have a broader time perspective is costly and may not be well attuned to the requirements of publication that yeah. uh, really passed along shadow on all young scholars. Because yeah. the yeah. publish of Paris is, uh, is uh, everywhere. I yeah. want to touch upon that as well, Yanis. But before we get there to this, yeah. um, how do we how do we express some of these broader ideas in, in scholarship? Um, the one other aspect about this idea of cult data as cultural records is, of course, that they are socially constructed. Um, and you know, I always think of this analogy to history, where they say the winner writes the history, right? The winners create the data about the records of the past, you know? And it's also, as a German, of course, we've done this quite, uh, in a, you know, in a very, very horrible way. If you think about all the years leading up to the World War II, that's a very obvious example of how you change history by, by basically, you know, creating fake records of it and creating fake data about it, etc. So bear with me. Um, the analogy that I see here is now as we move, fa move uh, fast forward into the age of AI and we have all these al AI algorithms that are trained on data, much of this data, especially from these algorithms that are from the required label data, I find it fascinating to think about how we even construct this data that we then feed into the algorithms, right? If you know that there are in, in entire cohorts, it's entire professions whose job it is to do data pre-labeling to make the data records useful for even for our algorithms, right? And in your article, you talk about this yeah. data versus algorithm bit. I think this is this is a fascinating bit about that we yeah. that moves away from this data on just facts or representations that can Absolutely. be yeah. willfully constructed and sometimes with all weird sorts of consequences. Very insightful observations, uh, Jan. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, this we may open Pandora's box here. Algorithms <laughs> are important, and I have kept saying this for years to a few friends and colleagues. But the traction of the word algorithm today is beyond any proportion, and it does damage to the IS field and to the social sciences. How, what do I mean by does damage? It hides and reifies a lot of things and processes that happen and punctualizes them in one word, algorithm. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, in this respect, it's an obstacle to the deconstruction of the organizational, economic, and social relations out of which data are constructed and fed into these algorithms. It hides all this complexity. And uh, in this regard, I feel that it does. It is too simple a concept often. You know, or if it's not yeah. simple, because building up complex algorithms are not simple things, but mm. it's being used in research in a simple way. So, Yanis, here's how I would, and I'm inferring from what I'm hearing based on my own worldview, uh, right, that what you're really trying to go for is a processual view of the world. And we're stuck with this object view of the world. So even though you're talking about objects, when I read, and maybe I'm just projecting, maybe this is not the way you think, but even in this paper, you're talking about... Uh, processes of of transforming data, of processing data, of datafication, right? You have process words all throughout. This algorithm is not a, it, it, the way they're used is part of the process, but the way we use them as researchers is where they're things, right? They're stable, specific, fixed? functional yeah. things. And I think, uh, I think that's the problem is that uh, in this flux of data, you know that that we're uh, that is that is a process. Data is not a thing; it's a process. It's a continually evolving uh, thing that we grab and we organize around. Uh, and what your and, and what it, when we use the term algorithm, now what we've done is stabilize something that's in flux. And not just we as researchers using the term algorithm, but I think in industry, when we take a particular data set, use it to train some predictive model, and then use that prediction, we've frozen the a, a little part of the flux uh, for a very specific purpose. And of course, that's going to have all sorts of uh, uh, unintended consequences, yeah. stabilization, yes. reification. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think let's put things in, in perspective. So our audience don't, doesn't misunderstand us. So we don't debunk algorithms. They do a marvelous job, technically, because they are able to do something concrete out of these masses of data, organize them in, and, and do something important in some aspect of life in which they are being used to interfere. In this respect, they are wonderful. They do a lot of important work. They do a lot of things that are meaningful, relevant, and useful. But limiting our point of understanding what's going on today in just the concept, the construct of the algorithm amounts to a huge simplification. Because algorithms without data are just, as we say in the paper, sheer mathematical procedures. They have no value. If algorithms would be wired to life, they cannot be done in any other way through the data they are fed in. So the connection of algorithms with life is through data. Yeah. We can't therefore leave reflection on data out of our inquiry. Because also of the reasons that Jan mentioned before, data we feel sometimes are produced by default and sometimes perhaps yes, but most of the times are made and they are made on the basis of certain projects, certain interests and certain predilections, guys. I, I try to, I try to, um, let me play that back. And what I'm hearing you say is when we take a very popular theoretical lens on information, let's say affordances, yeah. When we theorize about affordance of certain classes of technology, let's say of uh, social media or now of AI or recommender system, whatever, um, what we should be doing is to actually unpack that box and say, well, affordances of what? Is this an affordance of the algorithm? Is it an affordance of the data? Or is it an emergent property, you know, that a technology affords something? And if it's an emergent one, then, you know, what property of data and what property of 
an algorithm perhaps that operates on the data, how what there interacts to produce this affordance at the at the level that we can actually observe it. Is that is yeah. that a faithful <laughs> playing back? I, I think so. I think so, Jan. Just to tell you the thing, algorithms today are learning algorithms, right? So what they do today, they will not do it tomorrow, or they will do it slightly different. That difference, I suggest, is attributable to the data by which they confront themselves with reality. Themselves, I mean algorithms, with reality. And this is an important point. And the algorithm is an important, I use an act of network theory that I never liked, but I use a concept, is an important punctualization, but nothing mm -hmm. more. We need then to unravel and deconstruct the steps through which this algorithm has learned this thing and not another thing. And it's not only in the connections of, of, of the neural networks themselves, it's only on the data that the algorithm has been fed in to learn. Or you can think of it as an experiment, right? I mean, I can take a, a, piece, a set of data and an algorithm, a particular mathematical procedure to compute something. And then um, tomorrow I can do the same thing and I can vary the data and it'll be different, right? It'll learn something different. Yeah. I can take the same data in a different procedure and it'll have a different outcome. And I can, of course, vary both. So it could be, I guess it could be attributable to both or either or, but certainly not just one of the two. Exactly. Right. You formulated so well, uh, Jan. Thank you so much. Yeah. Wrecker, so... Uh, we could talk about Yanis's work for quite a while. I want to shift to a, a different topic, but uh, because I'll tell you what, Yanis, I don't know if you know this, but your 2004 paper, it was in like IT and people or something that had such an impact on me. It got me thinking you were talking about ERP systems as procedural. I love yeah. that. Your yeah. work with uh, Hasselblad, is that yeah, his last name? One, I remember. Uh, you have a couple, you have a book chapter with him in particular, which is my favorite book chapter on institutions and technology. <laughs> and then you followed up a few years later with like a philosophy journal paper with the same guy. And and, uh, and so you do such cool stuff. We could talk to you all day, but I want to pivot a little bit because when Please. I first was introduced to your work, Kale told me, here, read this guy, you know, Giannis. But at the same time, he gave me another one. And apparently he was your friend or your mentor or your something, but Claudio Chibora. And I wanted to talk to you about Chibora because I read his Control to Drift paper and then I read some other things he did. And I heard this guy, he, he apparently passed away young, but I yeah. heard he was a, a remarkable character, right? Absolutely. Uh and I yeah. recommend everybody read Control to Drift. It's a really yes, nice book. That's a great paper, uh, right? Uh, yeah. uh, but it's a book. Yeah. yeah. Also paper, probably. It's a book they have done, and they've studied uh, infrastructures, corporate infrastructures, and that also, I think, in this book, Claudio, Claudio shows also uh, features he, what he will become in the next few years, the, his permanent collaborators, which is a group of Norwegians led by Ulle Hanseth and Eric Monteiro, which yeah. are now uh, very important IS scholars. Well, weren't you, were you at LSE together or well, were you there after? I, I joined LSE then at the year 2001 uh, and Claudio was instrumental in taking me there because mm -hmm. he has read my stuff and he liked it, and yeah. he was very instrumental. And we had, and he was absolutely a remarkable character, and a, I would say a very important and influential figure in the in IS. Yeah, yeah. And he was like incredibly flamboyant, right? So this is what I think. This is my Kali would always yeah, call he it. Was, uh, yeah. 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 Kali would call it Euro trash, the, some of the stuff we had to review, <laughs> because there are qualitative researchers. There is a lot who, of that stuff. Uh, yeah. I would agree with Kali. Well, yeah. but, the, but this is kind of what he's talking about, right? It's that uh, they would read some French social theorist or philosopher, and then they would write some qualitative papers, paraphrasing the French philosopher, interspersing quotes with all of their data. And this is really big, Euro trash. This is really yeah. Euro trash. Yeah. So, so I would see that. And what my theory was always this, that people would read Chibora and Latour and these people who actually were clever and had a nice turn of the phrase. And when you read them, it was a very fun read. 
So they're like, I can do that. So my sense is most of Europe, uh, qualitative kind of tradition is trying to imitate Claudio and they can't pull it off like he can. So they end up doing the Euro trash, right? Do you see what I mean? Uh, have you seen this? Yeah. yeah, I think the Euro trash, unfortunately, has uh, uh, this, uh, it has a bigger history and there's a lot of people that uh, do this uh, kind of job without really taking the pain to read carefully all these big thinkers, whether it's Foucault or, uh, uh, you know, all these French philosophers, including the German or Habermas yeah. or uh, many others. Yeah. He talked about the other time about uh, Berger and Lachmann. Lachmann yeah. and also, yeah, these are basically German tradition. They don't, t- they take a short cut on this. They extract something and they try to make a point. This, and yeah. often very badly. This, and also I review regularly papers on our journals, guys, and as a, as a rule, I reject all of them because I, Scully, I consider them Eurotrust. There are few people, but there are a few people who really take the insights of the big scholars seriously and try to see how they can unpack or use them to promote our understanding of how life is today, how digital technologies remake organizations and people, and how we, we could think about this remaking mm-hmm. more creatively. But let me just tell you, Nick, make, make a connection between what you talked in the other podcast of, of yours the other day about Simon, about West Churchman, and then epistemology, all from Popper, Kuhn, Lakatos. The book that makes Claudio known is a book published in 1993 and and is called Teams, Markets and Systems. And there is a thorough meditation on Simon Hmm. and cognition and the way systems, which for him is technologies, can do the job that teams or markets do. And which are the points in which one of them is stronger than the other and in how they play all together. And it's a marvelous book even today. It was published by Oxford University Press in 1993. Such books right. do not exist today. Well, I want to talk about this a little bit. I'm um, going to pick that up. Yeah, well, I don't know that book either, to be honest, but I'll, I'll make sure I'll get it. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to say, like, I, I understand the Euro trash. I don't think there's anything particularly European in that. So I think there's a lot of trash produced by a lot of people. I just wanted to say that. Um. <laughs> well, trash, but Probably, there's a particular yeah. type of trash that is Euro trash. Because yeah. in the US, we don't really do this. We have other dysfunctions. Uh, but the particular, one particular dysfunction of the European tradition, and I think it's because there's this, in the US, we don't have this. In the US, there's no pressure to be scholarly. Uh, you talk to five professors, they might tell you they don't read, you know, they don't read books. And, you know, uh, you couldn't do that in Europe. A European has to pretend like they read books and like they're familiar with the major scholars, right? So so there's this intellectual bent in Europe that we don't have in the US. Uh, yeah. So I think this intellectualizing and trying to appear, and then there's a this obfuscatory element that goes along with it. And Giannis, I wanted to ask you this. A lot of people are into Deleuze and Gutierrez and, and, and Delanda and this... I've tried a few times. I get some idea there's maybe a systems thing. Is that just, is it all bullshit? And it's like people just creating a little framing of of common sense and hiding it behind a whole bunch of bullshit? Or is there something there? Like, should I, should I try again? <laughs> like, this is how I felt with Heidegger. I tried so many times with Heidegger. And then I actually went back and, and I even listened to to podcasts about Heidegger, figuring if I can't read it directly, maybe people will explain it to me. But it's just a bunch of bullshit, right? <laughs> and that's how I look at Deleuze. That's a, and I can't, I cannot get past it. It's just ontological bullshit using a different language to say what we know in common sense. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a difficult discussion, Nick, and I don't have an answer. I just can agree with you. I have loved some pieces of Heidegger. I will recommend one for everybody which for me is an unsurpassable piece of work that should be introduced into the last class of the Lyceum for everybody to read. And it's called The Age of the World Picture. 
is an incredible piece of work and Heidegger is as lucid as he can be when he wants to be lucid. It's an, uh, an incredible piece. And also the question concerning technology. Oh, so he was old then. That was 1977. I just pulled it up, right? 76, 77. No, no. I think he wrote this in 1938, but then he may be republished in several other oh. scenes. Uh, 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 and it describes how the modern sciences have been uh, created, how each one of them slices one piece of reality and projects it out there, that its observations are concordant with the way they perceive the world. Things you and I, uh, guys, would agree on most of them are a superb piece of work, and even better are the footnotes of this article. <laughs> hmm. All right. It. 15 pages of the article and another 15 pages of footnotes. So you have to read both. So I have to try Heidegger again. I'm doing it, Yanis. Yeah, I'm going but, to read but it. This, this Heidegger, because there are well, the tradition of Heidegger, the metaphysics. Nicholas, we don't belong into this. We have other references. How can we enter this? Yeah. These are discussions that go on since ancient Greece. They have their language, their techniques, their ways of talking. You cannot extract and suddenly take this and do something. They ask for you to become one of them, and you can't do it in a such short period of time. And most importantly, when you have other things to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, I feel like Chibora. I think Chibora and Wyke were both Heideggerians, right? They use ideas like thrownness and hospitality. And I, I became a friend of Chibora because I was also fond of Heidegger and I've written. But the way I understood Heidegger is obviously different from many other ways. I've read also a book about time, uh, like a slight book that Heidegger has written, and I also loved it. He made me understand the modern world different. But this is not the Heidegger that people speak about. And then these concepts of being and design, they are very difficult concepts. Yeah, that's what turned me off, actually, the being in time yeah, and design and hair splitting around. Because, mm. because they are the job of philosophers. Mm. We are thoughtful scholars and we want to be. And we want to be influenced by many of them. But we are not metaphysics philosophers, Nicholas. And I think this should be become clear. And this leads me back to Deleuze. Deleuze is a great scholar, very difficult to read, agonizing. But some of the things he says are marvelous. But then whether yeah. this can be assembled into something that can be relevant for IS, I doubt a lot. Yeah. And I don't know which way this can be achieved. So, Yanis, I wanted to ask you something quite personal. Yeah. Um, so it goes; it fits into this discussion here, right? So, so you are you've written some very powerful books. In fact, you have a new book coming out uh, next year, I believe, and and yeah. and that alone makes you different from most of our scholars at our age in our field, including the the the, the people that we call the big thinkers. Yang Jin and Cal, you know, and they're not writing books. No one is writing books anymore, right? We had an entire episode on that. Um, but but you are. And and I remember last year we talked about your paper already, and I basically criticized it and said, like, look, it would be even more powerful if some of the ideas were would be made more accessible to people. Now I wanted to ask you this. Um, you know, you said like Deleuze and Heidegger, they also they have some great, very powerful intellectual contributions, but also they're very inaccessible. Some of that stuff is impenetrable by many people. And the sheer fact that they're writing books is is basically putting people off. And yeah. you know, you you're sort of doing the same thing. And do you do you sometimes do you think about this whether or not you should make some of the ideas more accessible? Or do you I'm wave sure. it off and say, yeah. look, uh you know, the mob the mob doesn't need to read this because they're not gonna get it anyway. You you know where I'm getting with this? I, I wonder absolutely, about this. How important absolutely. is accessibility of an idea? Yeah, uh, I I continue to be, I believe, uh, what I always wanted to be, Jan, but if I was able to rewrite some of my earlier stuff, I would write this in the direction of being more accessible. So this is a direct answer to your question. Mm -hmm. I also struggle to understand myself and the world and organizations, teams and information systems and in this struggle, I wasn't always clear. Some, sometimes the theory came before the reality, so to say, concepts 
were used in a way that really covered rather than discovered the world. Uh, I have learned a lesson from all these years, but I won't take the opportunity also to mention, guys, that my collaboration with Christina changed me entirely. Mm. Because having I've written a lot of articles myself. I'm one of one of those I scholars probably that have the most uh, articles alone. Writing with another, and specifically with another that is very sharp, but also has a sense for the real, because she's a woman, I don't know, because she is what she is. Christina made my writing much better, but also offered me a converse, a conversant all the time. So this yeah. book of ours that we wrote together and coming out now from the MIT Press, some portions of it would be already available electronically. You will be able to download by chapter. Even it would be strong, difficult to read the chapter alone, but it would be possible. It will be already early April, I think. But the printed version of the book will come out in June. This book has taken us 10 years approximately wow. to work. It doesn't mean that we worked every year. Yeah, of course. Right? Yeah. No. Yeah. Mm. Every now and then, some longer periods, and then interrupted by other things, because Christina is also in the this game of publish and purchase, yeah. and she's a younger scholar. She needs to publish, and uh, and therefore uh, we had to work together. I also want to interact with my community uh, and publish articles as well. But then it took us quite a bit of time. And that is a different kind of undertaking, Jan, uh, Ian, Jan and Nicholas. And it's not well aligned with the way the institutional games of promotion and the way young scholars... Uh, no, uh, we're not rewarded. ...which young scholars find themselves. Because if they don't publish journal articles, they will not be... Yeah, no one promoted. cares. But here's my way out of this. I agree. Here's the way out. But I think the way out is to to not put this as on the as a burden on the young scholars, but to put it as an extra burden on all those chair professors that we have around. And you know, I'm looking, looking at one here specifically. Um, but you know, before we went online, uh, we talked about Yang Jin and we talked about uh, uh, Kala. And I actually said to Pana, look, you know, they, these guys should write up a book because some of their ideas, I think, some. They have more to say, and I think they have made more connections than is even visible in any of one of these papers. And even yeah. Nick, I, I put you in the same boat, right? So, like I've, I've been saying to you, like, why are you writing another paper? I know you're working with young junior scholars. Let's let's. But if you weren't doing that, or if you aside from that, I think the the owners would be on on people like us who ha have the chair, they have the tenure. Do you know why are we producing another twenty articles right. so a year? The, what the I, hell? I understand what you're saying, and that's a good point. But here's the deal, dude. There are two things. First off, we are now trained and socialized in a game. You talk about Kale. Kale wrote books he, in, early in his career, right? He has a, a really cool one on uh, uh, data modeling and uh, That's right. philosophical yeah. underpinnings of, of data modeling and, and, and uh, IS methods, right? So he, he at least one, and he's done some other books. So Kale has actually done books, but uh, Young Jin, I don't think, has. Uh, but here's the deal. You uh, play a game, and it's a game of top-tier publication. They figured out the game. There are young people. There are mid-career people that are working with them. They're, they're now socialized into that game, right? So then take – so there are two problems with a senior person doing it. One is when you take them out of that game, now there are junior people, PhD students, that sort of thing that don't get their attention, at least not as much. So that's one thing. The other thing is they maybe can't do it anymore. Right. All their good ideas were 20 years ago. Now it's like uh, maybe they don't have the good ideas. Uh, maybe, maybe not. But I did want to tell you this. Did you know this, that Giannis talks about writing with Christina? You know, that's his wife, right? I know that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So and you married her recently. So was it over 10 years ago or right around 10 years ago when you started uh, we, the book? We or married 10 you... years ago. We married in 2018 formally. Yeah. But we were living okay. together. Yeah. So you started your book together. That was like the first thing you did, right? Yeah. Is... 
Well, I think it's funny because uh, imagine because my wife doesn't talk to me about any of my work, right? Yeah, she can care less, but, right? And it's like it would be so interesting to be married to someone who actually cares about my work. And I, well, I mean, we care about each other's work, but it's like do the same thing and collaboratively. I don't know. That's yeah. I have a similar question. <laughs> Um, my mm-hmm. question was, uh, Yanis, um, I've been working with, with some friends and colleagues over a very theoretical piece, and it's very difficult. And it's so difficult that we get very emotional about it in the process. So this is behind closed door in our Zoom calls and so forth. It's it's really, there's a lot of fighting over ideas and standpoints and mm-hmm. assumptions and so forth. Now, and, and my that theory is saying. that is just a characteristic of, of theoretical work that, that just comes with that territory. But then yeah. I'm thinking, well, and then a marriage, I mean, then you have to switch off the Zoom and, you know, go in the <laughs> kitchen and be nice to one another. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, there's a lot of quarrels if you want to know, guys. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, uh, they end uh, up. Uh, and uh, I said to friends, joking a little bit, that writing this book uh, brought us to divorce several times. But this is <laughs> great. <laughs> well, and she's Italian and you're Greek, right? Yeah. So it's like yeah. there's a lot of Mediterranean volatility yeah, going on. There's a little bit of uh, dramatism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, guys, uh, this has been wonderful. Giannis, I feel like we could talk to you all day. You, again, I admire you so much. I think you do very cool stuff. And I, I just want to throw one more plug for your those two papers, and we have to put them up because we don't have time to talk about it. Maybe at a future uh, <laughs> episode we can talk about institutional theory. But I really think that you have a perspective on materiality and technology in institutions yes. that uh, – you know, foreshadowed, and it was way ahead of the game. Like right now, the institutional theorists are trying to get at materiality. And they're not, and and their valorization, and they have these other ideas to avoid materiality at all costs as they purport to be attending to materiality. So I think you actually attended to it, and you were the first in kind of the organizational IS world. Uh, So I do want to plug that. And yeah, maybe in the future, we should talk more about that. But but again, Giannis, thank you for coming on your... I admire you so much. I'm thrilled that you came aboard. I have again. a story. If you, if you have one minute, I can we tell do. you. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, is, uh, there is an article by Meyer and Scott, uh, two major institutional figures. They, yeah. they have defined the field in which they define institution as what is not technology. So institutions are only those things that are valorized. And uh, therefore, this has led... A lot of many people over the years, they advised me all oh, these things with technology you should take out of the <laughs> of uh, the you know inquiry and research and institutions. And now they are doing the same. They write articles very superficially, of course, about technology and institutions. But the point of uh, the point, uh, guys, of uh, we want to make and we like to make before as we started our discussion and i close with this is if you read the idea we said in the beginning that the forms of re- records and forms of making data register and using them in systematic ways has led to the establishment of corporations it's an idea of chandler corporations are institutions the same idea you find in benninger Another great scholar, the control revolution. Control Some revolution. Yes, recur also in John Yates' work to be on uh, fair to her. Control through communication, John yeah. Yates. Yeah, sure. yeah, because this is the link between technology, forms of works, and institutionalization. I know this has been thrown out of the window by these people because of several kinds of predilections and several kinds of misunderstanding along the process, but also because they felt threatened. I have a lot of stories to tell you, but this I should rather tell you privately about how these people safeguard what they think they have created and they don't want people that disrupt their little pitch, you see. Yeah. Wow. All right. So, Yanis... Um... Maybe one one uh, one last thing from you. What we often ask is is, is people to, to give some advice to junior scholars. We have a lot of junior scholars listening to this. Is there any one thing you would like to um, tell them yeah. to help them on their way? I, I think one first thing is that they will listen to the podcast of yours, 
the one uh, on epistemology, <laughs> the one on uh, on, uh, on Simon, the importance of Simon, the importance of great scholars, West Churchman. They should try to read more than these little articles required to be published because they need to have more, something more than they, what they publish. And if they don't have this something more, their articles will be flat and they will not make any contribution to anything. They will be forgotten after a few years. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to have an impact and to have an impact on the community you work on, you have to grapple with all, of course, these difficulties we've mentioned, publishing articles, collecting data, but also reading great stuff that goes beyond your little time window and try to see what you can do with this stuff. For our, our field, guys, as you said previously, without having read Simon, you are not supposed to make a contribution anywhere. And he's not <laughs> the only one. There are several of them. West Churchman is another. And I can take also to James March's work, who wasn't Simon exactly, but organizations written in 1958 is also something that every young scholar will read carefully. It's incredible stuff that survives yeah. a time that only forgets. Because this time forgets is uh, our pieces. It's like the songs of Lady Gaga. After uh, <laughs> after a little while, they've been forgotten. But these <laughs> the songs of Lady Gaga. <laughs> but uh, that, that is you just created the title for this episode. It'll be called "The Songs of Lady Gaga Will Be Forgotten." <laughs> Fantastic. But it's amazing, guys, that a book like Organization is such a little tiny book that has been written in 1958. Oh, tell me, in everything, they foresaw the, the, the exploration, exploitation, right? They foreshadowed that. All yeah. of Simon's procedural stuff. Literally, every chapter has like entire bodies of research just uh, stemming from it, right? And and yeah, it is. You're right. That's a great book that everyone should read. And I should go back and read it again. I haven't looked at it in a while. I do regularly. These also Karl Weick's The Social Psychology of Organizing. That's a fun one. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Jan, then, uh, that would be my answer to all these young scholars. Take the time every now and then and read some of these bigger, some of these works of a greater animation, of, you know, greater ambition. I like this very much, Yanis, and and it makes me feel good about myself too because it, and I, Nick and I, we started this tradition of giving each other Christmas presents, and we give, give each other a book a year. It's only one book a year, but of course, because it's social pressure, we do end up reading the book. So I have Nick's new you know book what he on did? my desk right This now. is what really <laughs> happened. He bought me a book for the first year. I'm like, thank you. Uh, I got a gift. Great. And I'm like, okay, now what do I do? And then he tells me, well, next year you have to buy me a book. You're off the hook this year, but next year you have to buy. So now that I've been true. buying him books every year. Giannis, the only two people I buy presents for are my wife and apparently Wrecker now. My <laughs> wife gets them for everybody else, right? <laughs> so that's that's it. You have some of these young scholars, perhaps, that you work with. You should buy some books uh, to them as well. Buy uh, some books for them? Okay, maybe I will. That's a, that's a good start. All right, guys. It was wonderful. Yanis, thanks so much for taking up the time and, yeah. and coming on, on the show. Uh, it was great talking to you. Absolutely. Let me also take the time, guys, to say that it's an honor that you have invited me. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, and I look forward to hear this podcast sitting in my armchair and being angry with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I doubt that. That's your, uh, your son, uh, Jan. Yeah. And he tells me there's other things other than books and research. All right, guys. Nice talking to you. Mm -hmm.